So in this section, we're going to talk about some extensions of Mendelian genetics or times where maybe Mendelian genetics, that classic dominant recessive relationship, don't always explain the expression patterns that we see. Um, and so for Mendelian genetics, the idea is that you know, genes are present on homologous chromosomes. Uh, you may have different alleles on each chromosome, or you might have the same allele um, if you're homozygous, dominant, or recessive, or you're heterozygous, and that uh, chromosomes can segregate and assort independently. Now, um, a couple of the, I guess, exceptions or extensions of Mendelian genetics that we're going to talk about are one, gene interaction where a single phenotype is affected by more than one set of genes. Uh, for example, human eye color, human uh, skin color, human height, uh, and X linkage, genes that are present on the X chromosome. Um, and in both of these cases, it's not as simple as like a dominant recessive. There are a number of different factors involved that can affect expression. So again, as a review of what we talked about um, on Wednesday and Thursday, alleles are alternative forms of a gene. And having different alleles can lead to different phenotypes. It can cause the organism to look different. But where do we get these different alleles? So these different alleles arise through mutation, right? Changes in the DNA. And as we talk more about how you go from DNA to RNA to protein, um, we'll talk more about this but I'm assuming you talked about this in some of your earlier biology classes as well. When you change um, the order of bases on the DNA, you usually end up changing the protein that gets made. And when you change the protein, uh, when you change its sequence, you can change its structure and its function. And these are just a few examples. You can eliminate enzyme function, so you could knock out the function of the enzyme you can change um, its efficiency, you can even change what it does through mutation. And so it's these mutations that give rise to these different alleles that give us different phenotypes. When we have an allele that is present at the highest frequency in the population, we say that that is the wild type allele because the majority of the individuals have it that does not necessarily mean that it's the dominant allele. There are some conditions, for example, Huntington disease, where the dominant allele actually leads to the disease, but the majority of the people have the recessive allele. So the wild type would be um, the recessive. So it's usually, but not always, dominant. So when we have mutations that affect the function of the resultant protein, um, we can say that they are loss of function where basically what's happening is maybe not that the gene doesn't work at all, but that it has lost the original function or the wild type function. So maybe it behaves, but it behaves a little bit differently. Um, for example, the yellow and green peas, right? It still makes a pea and the pea still has a color, but we've lost the yellow color and we've gotten a green color instead. So it causes the loss of the wild type function. Gain of function mutations enhance the function of the wild type. For example, maybe the quantity of the product produced increases. And again, what I really want you to think about is gain of function doesn't necessarily mean better. What if we're talking about a gene that is responsible for driving the cell cycle, for causing cells to replicate? If we get a gain of function mutation, where now the cell is replicating more than it should, that's bad. And we can also have neutral mutations where um, we don't see any change to the phenotype. So maybe the gene sequence is different but the protein sequence isn't, or maybe the protein sequence is a little bit different, but it doesn't have an effect on how the protein functions.
Um, so there's no change to the evolutionary fitness of the organism. Uh, we've also talked about this already, that we generally will use um, italic uppercase letters to represent the dominant allele, and the recessive would be lowercase. Uh, sometimes you can use two allele or two letters to represent the allele. Uh, oftentimes, though, we just do single. Uh, mutant alleles uh, would also be uh, indicated by, uh, this is in fruit flies, uh, the E. Wild type would have the letter, like let's say it's E, plus uh, the subscript. So if you were looking at these two, you could say, oh, the one with the superscript plus sign is wild type. The one without the plus sign uh, is a mutant. So they give an example here of fruit flies, and I told you in fruit flies they notate things a little bit differently. So instead of using, you know, that classic um, lowercase and capital E, like we might think of, they use, right, the mutant and the wild type. And so, again, you could have an individual that is E plus E plus, that would be the wild type, and they would be gray. E plus E, um, they also would look like the wild type because they would be gray, but they are heterozygous because they have one of each. Uh, or you could have two E's without the plus, uh, that's the mutant phenotype, and the color is ebony. The other way they do it is just instead of using the letter, they'll put the plus sign. Uh, either way is fine with me. There are also situations uh, where genes maybe are not necessarily uh, dominant to one another. Maybe they can both be expressed equally or something like that. Um, and in that case, they would both be capitalized, both alleles would be capitalized, but you can use a superscript, either a number or another letter, um, to indicate that they are different alleles. So the first situation that we're going to talk about um, as kind of those extensions of Mendelian genetics are what happens when neither allele uh, is dominant. And so we can have what's called incomplete or partial dominance. And this is one of those situations um, that we talked about on Thursday where Mendel's hypothesis was kind of this like discontinuous variation. You're either purple or you're white and that's it. Um, and then Darwin and Wallace had this more continuous variation where an individual looks like a blend of their parents. And I told you, technically, they're both right sometimes. So Darwin was right in his discontinuous when he was talking about purple and white flowers. Um, but uh, Darwin and Wallace were also correct and they were correct in this case here of, of an intermediate phenotype where the offspring actually looks like a mix of the parents. And so one example is also flowers, um, but it's a different type of flower. Red snapdragons crossed to white snapdragons. And when you cross a red and a white snapdragon, um, oftentimes you might think, well, red is probably dominant, so I get a red flower. Uh, and actually you don't, you get a white, uh, a pink flower. And so that means that the white is still playing a role. It's not hiding in there and being uh, overrun by the red. And in that case, we call it an incomplete dominance because red uh, is not completely dominant over white and white is not completely dominant over red. So when you do the cross, when you cross two true breeding snapdragons, you cross a true breeding red with a true breeding white, uh, you end up with all pink. They're heterozygotes. Um, and then in the F2, you end up with a quarter of them being red, a half of them being pink, the heterozygous, um, and half of them being white. Now the genotype ratios are the same uh, as the phenotype ratios because the heterozygous genotype has its own phenotype. And we can do this uh, as a Punnett square. First, I'll show you the, um, you know, kind of 
cross graph that they did. But if we want to do it as a Punnett square, we can definitely do that too. And so to do that as a Punnett square, what that's going to look like So because neither um, allele is dominant to the other, I'm going to call them R1 and R2. So R1 is going to represent the red allele. Uh, R2 is going to represent the white allele. And so we're starting out with R1, R1 crossed with R2, R2. I almost said R2D2. Um, and so we're crossing a red and a white flower, All right? So this is our parental generation. So for our F1, if we're gonna do the Punnett square, this individual can only give the R1. And I'm gonna do an abbreviated Punnett square instead of the full one. This individual, so let's say that one's male, this one's female, it doesn't really matter, it's fine. Uh, this one can only give an R2. So that's it, I have one gamete here, one type of gamete here, so all of the offspring, 100% of the offspring, are heterozygous. They have one copy of each allele. But because this is not um, a true dominant recessive relationship, this is an incomplete or a partial dominance, uh, we end up with pink flowers. So now we can cross, right, these two and get our F2 generation. Uh, so we'll do the cross. Uh, now we can give each type of gamete okay so now um, we do our phenotypes out here. So this individual is going to be red. So I have a red individual. This individual is going to be pink. So I have one pink. This individual is also going to be pink. This individual is going to be white. So I end up with a one to two to one ratio. So when you're talking about this type of incomplete dominance, if you use two true breeding individuals, uh, your F1 will be the heterozygotes that show that mixed phenotype. The F2 will return both of the parental phenotypes um, and also have some of that uh, intermediate phenotype as well. Now we can also talk about this in humans. There are genetic conditions in humans that we do see what's called um, incomplete dominance. An example of a condition like this is called Tay-Sachs disease. Uh, Tay-Sachs disease has a much higher incidence in people of uh, Jewish descent. Um, and so they recommend that individuals, especially if uh, you have two individuals that have that come from Jewish backgrounds, especially like from European Jewish backgrounds, that um, you get screened for this condition because it's at such a higher prevalence in those um, people of the, those ethnic backgrounds. Because what can happen is if two carriers get together and they have a child who is homozygous recessive, um, those children will die. It is a fatal disorder in in infants, the neonates. Um, it's a lipid storage disorder, um, and so they, they can't really metabolize um, lipids appropriately, and they will die. Now, the reason we say this is incomplete dominance is that the carriers, the heterozygotes, um, they have one normal allele, one wild-type allele, and one mutant allele. Um, they make half the amount of enzyme. They don't make the full amount of enzyme as somebody who has two uh, wild type alleles. However, that does not affect their lifespan. 
that half amount of enzyme is enough for survival. Um, and so we call it the, the threshold effect, where as long as you have a certain percentage of the product being produced, you won't see an effect on the phenotype. And so in Tay-Sachs disease, as long as you're making 50% of the enzyme you need, you're not going to see a phenotype. And so that's why carriers, they won't know they're carriers because they're able to make like just enough. Now, incomplete dominance and co-dominance sound like they might be very similar, um, and in some ways they kind of are, but the heterozygote is not so much a blend as it is both are expressed equally. Um, and so in co-dominance, there's no dominance, there's no recessiveness, there's also no um, incomplete, and there's no blending. It's joint expression of both alleles. And so what does that look like? Well, a classic example is blood groups. Um, we have lots of different blood groups, not just A, B, and O. Uh, we also have uh, M and N. And this is an example of codominance in humans. So if an individual has both uh, copies of their alleles as the M allele, their phenotype will be M. If an individual is heterozygous, they have the phenotype capital M, capital N, um, and if the individual is homozygous for N, then their phenotype is N. And you might be thinking, well, isn't this kind of the same as, you know, a red flower and a white flower giving you a pink flower? Um, and it's actually not exactly the same. So what this particular allele does is it puts a protein on the surface of the blood cells. And so um, let's look at our different conditions. So if we have somebody who, we have this individual right here, that means on the surface of their blood cells, they only show M, right? Only M. And that makes sense because they're the M. What else are they going to show? Now this individual down here shows only N, 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 right? That, and that also makes sense. So what does this individual show? In the case of something like incomplete dominance, they would show a, a weird hybrid letter because neither one gets expressed properly. But in a co-dominant situation, what you actually see is that they show M and N equally. There's no um, change in how they look. They just show both. And so that's what we mean by co-dominance. Both alleles are equally expressed rather than blended together to form some weird like M and N hybrid. And the way you would do, you know, the Punnett square and set that all up is, is going to be very similar. If you cross two heterozygotes, you're going to get that one to two to one ratio, just like you see with the incomplete dominance.